Good morning, everyone. Can you hear me okay? Uh, I'll ask our morning plenary panelists to join me before we begin this welcome. You cannot hear me? Mich Michelle, I think there's an echo. Okay, thank you all. I, thank you, especially, I appreciate that. Okay, good morning, everyone. We're so happy to welcome you to the CUNY Graduate School of Public Health and Health Policy uh, to take part in Public Health Everywhere, non-traditional career paths. My name is Hannah Stewart-Lathan and I am the Director of Experiential, thank you, oh, thank you, I apologize. Can you hear me from here? I know this is gonna, is this working? I'm gonna do it all over. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. We are so happy to welcome you to the CUNY Graduate School of Public Health and Health Policy to take part in Public Health Everywhere, non-traditional career paths. My name is Hannah Stewart-Lathan and I am the Director of Experiential Learning and Career Services and our office is proud to host this event today. You will meet leaders in public health who have taken risks and acted from a place of passion throughout their multifaceted careers and they've shaped the field for the better in doing so. There will be a Q&A at the end of this plenary panel and you have either received an index card uh, and a pen from one of our staff or you are welcome to take one from our team who will be floating around the sides of your rows. Today we're going to get to celebrate that creative spirit that I referenced and I have the honor of introducing our first moderator of our first panel to kick us off. Harry McGovern, our Senior Associate Dean of Academic and Student Affairs is an expert human rights lawyer, advocate, and academic who is internationally recognized for her work in health and human rights, sexual and reproductive rights and health, gender justice, and environmental justice. And I'm also very proud to say she is my boss. Please join me in welcoming her this morning. Hello, can you hear me? Good morning, everybody. Uh, really happy to see so many faces here. Um, before I introduce our, our brilliant panelists, um, I wanted to, Hannah asked me to talk a little bit about my own non-traditional career. So uh, when I graduated from law school in 1986, if somebody told me I was going to end up as a senior associate, whatever my very long title is, I would have said, that's impossible. Right. Um, so I have had many different iterations of my career, but just to say, I ended up deciding I wanted to be a poverty lawyer in 1987, just as the HIV epidemic was hitting the city. And uh, I understood very quickly that there was a whole different e epidemic happening for women, for people of color living in the projects. And um, set about trying to figure out you know what were significant structural structural barriers racism sexism um, in fact they hadn't studied women uh, and the early aids definition which was adopted by medicaid disability it was the entryway to housing was actually did not include many of the illnesses that my clients were getting so um, interestingly evidence, we had the evidence to prove discrimination and we ultimately did a class action and won the class action, but I needed to work with public health folks, right, to actually track what was happening, to actually show the patterns that the federal government had not had missed so that we knew what was happening with women, so that we had the science and the evidence. So very early on, out of necessity, some very brave public health people agreed to work with me and do the studies that needed to be done, along with lots of health and hospital doctors, a lot of health workers, healthcare workers. Um, and they also did very brave things, like people were working with records, deaths, death records, and said, actually, I know that there are, you know, thousands of HIV positive women and people of color who never got AIDS who died. Um, so they actually supplied really significant evidence for the lawsuit. So um, in and out, in and out, I did that work for many, many years. And when I decided I wanted to do something different, I taught a bunch at law schools. And I actually always liked the interdisciplinarity of 
public health. And so I ended up, you know, running Health and Human Rights out of Columbia. And then I was at the Ford Foundation. And there I did a lot of intellectual property work, right? Patents, you know, um, all of those issues that were critical. Who gets treatment? Who doesn't? Um, so I have made lots of twists and turns. Um, and, and probably the one that makes me happiest is the one that brought me here. Uh, kind of full circle to where I did a lot of community work. I represented lots of folks who are long dead, unfortunately, in Harlem. Um, so it's very, very exciting for me to end up back here um, and getting to work with all of you and, and getting to participate in things like that, this, that really celebrate, I think, creative risk takers. Um, and that's exactly who our three panelists are. So let me let me shift into that. Um, so Dr. Michaela Martinez is a Chicana scientist, artist, justice advocate, and the director of environmental health at We Act for Environmental Justice, and so much more. But the questions will get at that. Um, Lillian Sepulveda is a human rights lawyer and executive director at Glo Global Doctors for Choice. Welcome. And Larissa Trinder is the Assistant Vice President for Arts and Medicine at New York City Health and Hospitals. Um, and uh, all three of these, of these women are amazing. So I'm very excited to have this chat today. So we're gonna begin um, by just asking you to talk about your, non, your own non-traditional career paths. Um, how did you get started in your career? Um, and I think we'll start with you, Lillian, because you're looking at me. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Terry, so, so much. And to Hannah, too, for putting together this um, amazing uh, panel. Uh, so I think my path goes, um, and I'm going to give away my age, <laughs> way, way back uh, into my early years as a kid. Uh, so I was uh, born and raised in, in Chile in the 70s uh, during a very uh, dark period, you know, in Chilean uh, history. And so I grew up under the Augusto Pinochet uh, dictatorship um, in a very repressive uh, environment, um, you know, as a, as a kid. And my heroes growing up, you know, were the folks, women and men who dared uh, speak against uh, Pinochet in a very, very censored environment. And these folks happen to be lawyers by training. And so I said, that's what I wanna do. Um, and this was fueled by, you know, not only family conversations, dinner table conversations, but my family was missing from the dinner table, given that many of them were uh, tortured and executed by the regime. And the other half uh, all went into exile. So it was this very, very small um, dinner table. And, you know, that stayed with me uh, for a very, very long time. Uh, you know, a few years forward, we ended up emigrating to the United States. Um, but all along, I felt that I knew that I wanted to do human rights work uh, specifically. And, you know, uh, I was very grateful to have the opportunity, you know, in uh, this country to be able to go uh, to law school and do that. And your school reminds me of my alma mater, which is Rutgers University, which had such a strong public interest program, you know, and their mission was in service of uh, the community. So um, that's a little bit of my, my pathway. Thank you, thank you. Um, and Hannah, yes, thank you so much. This is one of the most well-organized convenings I think I've attended in a long time. Um, so my path is a little bit non circuitous also. I always was interested in public health and public service um, in high school and college, worked at Planned Parenthood, um, and was uh, then graduated from college with a degree in women's studies and political science. Um, so at that time, as Terry said, if you had said, oh, you're going to be the assistant vice president for New York City Health and Hospitals, arts and medicine, which what is that? Um, I would never have even imagined this is where I'd land. Um, but I certainly look back now and see a confluence of things coming together that certainly brought me here. <clears throat> so one of them, um, similar to you, was just always really a deep passion and empathy for others and um, advocacy for human rights. And so um, after college and um, 
I worked on Capitol Hill for a congressman who's a senator from Rhode Island now, Jack Reed, um, wrote women's issues and animal rights issues and some other things um, that at the time were considered like not that important. Um, and really learned a lot, but left that, got married, had children. And during that time, I got into development. Um, and I was the development director for the YWCA and did a lot around domestic violence at that time. And then ultimately landed in healthcare at a children's hospital in Virginia. And it was there that I started to, two things happened. The first was I had a young son at age five that was diagnosed with pretty extreme dyslexia. Um, and while it doesn't sound life threatening and it certainly isn't, um, you know, it really, really did affect him and was a very difficult early on struggle. What I did know immediately was that somehow the arts were really impacting him. And at that time, I didn't know how profoundly and he's now at SVA getting an MFA and he's, he did, he's done well. But if he did not have the arts in his life, he would absolutely have um, had a lot of challenges. So I, I had that kind of going as a mother, um, a young mother at the time. And then also I was the development director for the children's hospital and worked with a lot of high net worth individuals and people that were interested in supporting the children's hospital and realized why are we not um, tapping into the art community here as well? Because there, there's a lot of wealthy collectors. And so started to work with collectors and um, did one project with an artist and it was that was it. Like I started to think, oh my gosh, the arts are really doing something amazing in this hospital. And so we did the art policy and we developed that. And then to, to wrap it up, what I, I ended up at NYU for graduate school. In my 40s, I really thought, okay, I've done kind of interesting things. I really love the arts, but I know, knew that I needed leadership skills. And I'm, I know that your school has an amazing curriculum around this, so I'm sure you're already taking these. But for me, the leadership classes were really helpful um, for frankly what I do now. And also um, learning just very basic things, logic modeling and, and uh, fish boning and all these kinds of practical tools that help you to sort of determine and look at outcomes. Um, and of course, financial management um, was really helpful. So that's what really happened. And I graduated from that program and you know, long story short, ended up where I am when this position became available. I remember reading it and thinking, that is exactly what I want to do. And um, I've been here a little over two years, and I feel extremely honored to be doing what I'm doing. So listening to um, these two tell their stories, I'm like, where do I begin? What do I want to share? Um, but I guess one thing that I will say is that I like likely many of you come from a non-traditional background when it comes to um, academic spaces and higher education. I'm the first person in my family to go to college, and I actually started um, caught my kind of training at community college and essentially worked my way up um, through my PhD and then uh, my postdoc where I found myself at Princeton. And going from a low-income First gen backgrounds, you know, in a very impoverished community, all the way to some of the most um, privileged spaces in the United States, um, made me start to really understand my value system and how my education can, in some ways, center with my values, but then in other ways, kind of come to a head with it. So, the way that I uh, met Terry was we were both faculty at Columbia and the Mailman School of Public Health at the same time. I'm also non-traditional as a public health professional because my PhD is in ecology and evolution. So I'm an ecologist by training. And as ecologists, we are trained to look at the world in the big picture. And most ecologists um, study natural systems, but I study the human built environment mostly. And as I had progressed through my career, I um, found that really in in um, higher education spaces, even though we do talk a lot about diversity, equity, and, and inclusion, that's not always operationalized and truly practiced. And so recently I had found that academia was starting to kind of come to a head with my um, value system. And my lab had been studying structural racism. And I just found that we couldn't really do the work that we needed to do openly and honestly within an academic system, which is now why I find myself at We Act for Environmental Justice, which is an environmental justice organization founded here in Harlem. It actually was founded in the 80s when my boss, Peggy Shepard, 
and a number of other activists um, shut down the highway here at the end of um, 125th Street because of the sewage plant here at the end of the street was dumping raw sewage um, into the Hudson. And we've continued on that legacy of fighting environmental racism. And um, yeah, I guess I'll stop with that. Amazing, thank you all. So um, I think a question that students ask a lot is about risk. You, you each have to have taken some significant risks in your careers. Um, can you talk a little bit about that? How did you assess the, the, how did you make the decisions and what do you think about it now? Maybe Lillian? Yeah. Risk. Um, I think uh, emigrate, two things. Uh, emigrating to this country was a, a big risk, you know, for my family. Um, you know, and like your family, we have similar backgrounds in that, in that I was the first person to go to college um, in my extended family um, as well. Um, and we had a low, you know, income background um, as well. And I had to learn, uh, I think, pretty much everything from scratch coming to the States, English from scratch. So I would watch Mr. Rogers and Sesame Street and all these things at 17 years old. Um, but it was a risk because, um, you know, my parents didn't know if it was going to work out for us, you know, for our nuclear family. Uh, you know, work-wise, I think um, one risk that I always remember uh, taking was about 18 years ago when I got my second legal job. Um, I was at the time um, director for the Latin America program at the Center for Reproductive Rights, which is this global NGO that does reproductive health rights work um, around the world. And uh, we had this idea uh, with my, you know, wonderful boss at the time, uh, Luisa uh, Caval, is what if we focus our efforts in the United Nations? You know, they have these cool tools that people haven't tested yet, uh, accountability mechanisms, United, treaty, uh, United Nations treaty monitoring bodies. And what if we find a case, you know, uh, from the Latin America region and bring it to the UN. And so we developed a strategy of three cases uh, that were all at the time from Latin America where women and girls were being denied access to legal abortions in their countries. Uh, and these were cases from Peru and Mexico at the time. Uh, people in, you know, in the field and the region thought we had lost our minds. You know, how can you possibly hold the government of Mexico <laughs> accountable, you know, for violations of, you know, their national level laws, right? How could you do that? And so with some support at the local level in Mexico and in the area of Lima, we worked really hard to put together these cases and piloted them and tested them. And it took many years uh, but we were able to put and bring these stories to light to the United Nations. We ended up uh, winning all of the cases that we brought uh, to the United Nations, the various committees. And something that's been really gratifying for us, um, you know, it was a risk in the beginning, is that this in a way helped open the doors for others in the region and around the world to do the same. And to not only test ab abortion, uh, legal abortion, right? But, you know, does this constitute cruel and human integrating treatment, right? When you deny such services to, to women. And so, uh, you know, arguments got bolder and more creative. And it's really led to, you know, an interesting and very strong body of work and norm building around uh, right to access abortion. Because you took the risk to, to take the case. Boy, do we need you now. Case. Yeah. Um, so I just kind of have two uh, examples. One is a sort of a simple early on one. But when I was at the Children's Hospital, I was referencing there was an artist uh, from the Midwest that came and wanted to do a project with us. And I think that I'll jump to the end. I think the first thing is when you take a risk, like 
I entered into these projects knowing absolutely not what I was getting involved in. So it's okay if you're passionate about something um, because you'll learn so much on the way. But we did this amazing um, collaboration with this artist named Thurman Statum who created glass fish um, to hang in the children's hospital lobby. And he worked with the children in the pediatric oncology unit. We brought them to the Chrysler Museum of Glass studio to blow with the gaffers. And it was like this whole thing. And it brought in all the arts community. And it was just such a wonderful experience. But the entire process, which was like a year and a half, I mean, everybody in the hospital, I don't want to say hated me, but like they'd see me coming and like the facilities people, I mean, I cost them money and they were like they had extra headaches. And I just sort of made it up as I went along, knowing that what was going to be hope, ultimately accomplished was going to be amazing. And it, it's still, these fish still hang there today and they're really quite beautiful. But the other, and I think more profound risk for me, at least personally, was when I decided um, as an old person in my 40s to go to graduate school. Um, you know, I was living in Virginia at the time. I'm from up, I'm up from up here, um, but always had wanted to go back to the North and, you know, really um, thought, okay, I'm going to do this. So I commuted for um, every other weekend for two years to do this program and um, actually lived in Harlem during that time and really, um, you know, just went against the grain. I mean, people were like, what is she doing and what, what is happening? And so, um, you know, I really think that it, it was really helpful for me to take that risk at that time in my life, because if I had done it in my 20s or even 30s, I would not have learned what I, I would not have had the experience I had working already, but also to just really be at a position where I was gonna sponge it all up. Um, and I did, and I created a wonderful network that I continue to have today, so. So let's see, when it comes to risks, I will kind of cite two different risks that I've take, taken, but one of them was more personal, but did affect my um, career in some ways. And then the other one was completely career. Um, so back in, I guess now it was 2020, um, I had been caught up in the Bronx in one of the NYPD's um, kettling of protesters after George Floyd was murdered. And I decided that I was going to sue the NYPD for racism and sue the city. And I knew that this was going to be very public because this was a federal and, you know, is still a federal civil rights lawsuit. And like the NYPD is very powerful. At the time, I was a professor at Columbia. And so I was like, oh, man, this is going to be very public. Um, but I decided that it was important for me to I was well placed to be able um, to try to make them accountable for what they had done and knowing that um, a lot of my friends and community members um, did not have the same protections as me to be able to engage in such a lawsuit. Um, so I did, but then I found myself getting a phone call from like one of the board of directors um, from Columbia School of Public Health who was like embedded in uh, the NYPD. And I'm like, oh my gosh, this is going to harm my career. Um, but I decided to stick through it and um, really take that risk that I knew that I might be seen as like too radical or a bit of um, like a pariah within the academic space if I took such a bold action. But I decided to go with my gut and I'm still really proud of that to this day. And now um, we're in a settlement process. So if you look at now um, NYPD reform for protests, which should be rolling out this summer, that is um, because of that lawsuit. So take the risks and they can bear out in the long run. And then the other one was when I quit my job uh, about a year ago. So as I mentioned, I had been faculty um, at Columbia and then I had gotten um, recruited away to Emory University in 2001. And so I went to Emory and really it was about money for my lab. I had gotten a really amazing deal to move my lab down there, but it turned out that that environment that myself and my um, lab members would have to um, tolerate to stay at Emory was just not worth it because it's a very old institution and has a lot of problems with racism, which you can find just by Googling Emory and racism. <laughs> um, but uh, so I just decided it wasn't for me. I couldn't do my work there. I had a really lovely undergrad class called Imagine a Just City where students um, worked on social justice issues. And even though I thought I was building 
some really great spaces there. I just knew overall it wasn't a good fit. So without any job lined up and with me right about to get tenure, I um, wrote an email to my department chair and said, I am informing you that I am resigning from this position. And I just kind of let, uh, just did it on faith and said, I will find another job. I'm going to move back to New York City and what is meant for me will come to me. And now I'm here and I'm with We Act for Environmental Justice, which is like one of the best things that's ever happened to me. Hey, thank you. Um, so it's so interesting. It seems to me listening that each of you um, didn't necessarily fit. There wasn't a fit for you out there. So you kind of created things that where you did fit, right? Um, you all have underlying degrees that are not in public health. And can you talk a little bit about how the, how the training in another discipline kind of helps you in your public health work? Um, I'm sorry to keep starting with you, Lillian, but there you are. <laughs> Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so public health at the outset, you know, uh, in law school and right after graduating law school was not even in my mind, really. I, I knew that I wanted to do human rights work. I start my first job actually during law school and my first job, I continued that after graduation was um, I was part of a, a defense team uh, in Rwanda uh, we defended somebody who had allegedly committed crimes against humanity and genocide. Um, and, you know, I, I took that position, that job to learn something from that experience. Um, and I did that for a couple of years, but um, fortuitously, uh, one of the pro bono uh, lawyers who was supporting the case uh, worked at the Center for Reproductive Rights um, here in the U.S., and it was through her that I learned about women's health, reproductive rights, uh, you know, and so I started volunteering, you know, for, for the center. Once I got a job at the center um, as a very young, you know, rookie lawyer, um, I took one of my first cases, which was a case from uh, Brazil uh, that went to the UN, the Aline da Silva uh, case, um, a case about a 28-year-old 20 um, Afro-Brazilian woman who had an intended pregnancy at six months, she started losing her pregnancy and she ended up uh, bleeding to death because there was no access to, you know, health care uh, in Rio de Janeiro, <laughs> of all places, right, in Brazil. And we made some, you know, really strong arguments based on the CEDAW Convention, you know, on non-discrimination, right? We talked about the right to health. We talked about the right to equality, all of these, you know, wonderful principles. But we were missing something. You know, how do we show that at the time, Aline's case was not an isolated case? And so one of the smartest things we did was build a coalition of people and folks and experts in Brazil, which included public health experts, doctors, sociologists, um, that ended up working with us on the petition, on the case, and then post-decision on implementing um, the very strong recommendation uh, in our favor that we got from uh, the UN. So in addition to the complaint that we filed, we worked, and I still remember to this day, because it was brand new, it was a 70-page document that we called Contextual Considerations, which was all about public health and evidence. And that document was absolutely critical to the CEDAW committee finding in our favor in the Aline case. Um, and these were folks, experts who remained in the coalition working with the government to make sure that, you know, the various committees at the state level uh, in Brazil uh, would implement the Aline decision. Um, really interesting listening to Lillian. I think, you know, I already touched upon some of the, the course uh, work that I did at NYU and leadership, of course, I mentioned, but financial decision making was key um, and uh, public policy was also key. And I, I wanted to go to public policy. A, at the time, I didn't know that I was going to be so, frankly, impactful in public health. Um, and 
I just knew that being in New York City, I needed to understand and wanting to work for the city. I knew that I needed a really deep understanding of the different city agencies and how they all were linked together to create the greatest impact. So that was really my driving force. And again, I it just sort of iterated into this art space based on a, a whole confluence of things. Um, but when, but now when I think about public health and public health schools, it's really interesting because everything we care about in life is related to public health. Like any issue, I mean, reproductive rights, gun violence, I mean, anything that, you know, social justice issues, those are all impacting our public health. So whatever you're passionate about, and you're, you're in public health, so you're very passionate, empathetic people. Um, so whatever it is that you're passionate about, like, um, you can have a job in doing that. Um, and it can be related to public health. And that's kind of what I was thinking about as I listened to all of you um, talk today. Yeah, as I mentioned earlier, I um, have my PhD in ecology and one big subset of ecology is infectious disease ecology, which is my background. So you know, my PhD was on polio eradication and modeling childhood infectious disease dynamics. So I knew coming out of my PhD that I had this like great applied mathematics background that could be applied to other things besides vaccine preventable childhood diseases. And so I really just kind of jumped into it. I had never taken a class in public health when I became a faculty member of public health at Mailman, um, which was kind of funny. But, you know, I had the expertise um, in the infectious disease area, but I was like, okay, I guess I need to learn all this other stuff like air pollution and, you know, all these other areas. Um, but I actually found that coming in as an outsider to the field, it was very complimentary. So my colleagues who had traditional public health training could teach me a lot about the types of models that they used and their clinical trial setups, whereas I could bring my big data skills and computer programming skills and such um, into that space. And so that's what I've continued to do. You know, I'm a time series geek, which I've been forever, which is like long-term data that span time. And that's something that's also very valuable um, in public health. But oftentimes, um, clinical trials can be limited to kind of short, short, short time period. So I think from um, being able to come in from the outside, I've been able to offer some um, complementary new ideas. But then also my research has been enriched by gaining more traditional public health training. Sure. Because you both mentioned something very significant, and, and I did study this in graduate school as well. The research and evaluation piece is really, really critical. And at the time I was taking the class, and it was, I'm not as quantitative as you, so it was a little more challenging for me, but I apply it all the time now. And we've really um, upped our game at New York City Health and Hospitals and how we are looking at and researching and evaluating and gathering data for our art and cultural event interventions and looking at what that impact is based on very specific measures related to uh, burnout and other indexes. So um, having that kind of exposure, uh, not as to your extreme, but like just even a little bit of it was really, really helpful. Great. Um, I want to come back to the role of the arts in public health, but I just wanted to share a couple of more examples. So um, as a lawyer, I when I was at the Ford Foundation, I was in the health and human, I was in the human rights unit. Katrina happened. I went to New Orleans. I saw what was happening. I saw, you know, all of the, you know, first of all, overplacement of industry, which created all the conditions. I saw what happened. Um, and so I funded a bunch of lawsuits against industry, right? I funded a whole bunch of stuff because I was a donor at the Ford Foundation. Every one of them we lost um, because it was science, right? Industry came in saying, you can't link the exposure to the outcome. There's too many confounding factors. There's too many, it wasn't measured from the start. So it was all science. Um, and that even hardened my commitment to working across disciplines. And most recently, uh, Mikhail and I were put on this social justice commission for the mayor. And we took a really deep dive into um, land use approval processes, right? And what is in these environmental impact statements, right? We all know that there's overplacement of into toxic industry, toxic everything in communities of color, in low income communities, but what's going on at that, at that moment where the approvals are being made? That's a perfect example of where you need science, you need policy, you need lawyers. Um, and I think all three of these speakers are talking about 
how you make change and impact, it requires a lot of different actors. It requires a lot of different disciplines. Um, and you know that that has proven true again and again uh, in in I think all our careers. Um, but I do want to kind of go back to the to the role of the arts in public health. Um, I know that uh, two of you, uh, one of two of you are are artists yourselves, or right, um, or maybe three of you. Um, so any, I'll open it up to the three of you. Just how important, how, how do you think we've done in incorpor incorporating the arts? What could, could we do more? That kind of thing. Oh boy, that, that would be a whole afternoon panel um, to try to sort of think about this. Um, so the arts are an essential piece of equipment for hospitals. Without the arts and artists and cultural interventions, we are not providing the best kind of healthcare. And I'm very proud of New York Health and Hospitals because they made a very significant structural decision with my department, which was to place um, my department on the quality and safety cabinet. So I sit with 14 other departments from NYPD for hospital security to infectious disease to ambulatory care that are all there to look out for the uh, culture and wellness of the entire system, 42,000 employees. So, you know, it's a, it's a really, um, Dr. Katz, who's the CEO, and my boss, Eric Way, really recognized early on that in order to provide this kind of culture of safety, they needed to come up with a, a strategy. And, you know, we are one, one of those strategies. So, um, so for me, I just feel that the arts are really a very profound um, contribution. We are now, uh, New York City Health and Hospitals has the largest community mural program in any health system, and we are... Um, engaging right now in a global study with a hospital system from Slovenia, Nigeria, and the UK to look at how murals and artists are enhancing trust in health systems, creating a deeper sense of belonging. Um, and we're measuring this through evaluations and QR codes and all sorts of different um, assessment tools. But I think we'll we'll learn hopefully what we all intrinsically know up here to be true, which is that they are contributing meaningfully to public health. Um, and so we're hoping this is a two-year study or about a, almost a year in that um, this helps to lay the foundation for more granular studies and research after this. So I think that the arts are um, an increasingly significant contribution to public health. And I think COVID really taught us that. I rem remember driving up Fifth Avenue one day in my car thinking like, I'm the only car on Fifth Avenue right now. And it was so weird and it was so sad and everything was shut down. So the loss of um, art and culture, I think has contributed to loneliness and um, Vivek Murthy's advisory, uh, Surgeon General's advisory that came out. So we can solve this and, and arts are one of those con contributions. So I have a couple ways that um, art has influenced me as a person and um, weaved into my work. So I am an artist. I, in addition to my um, work as an advocate and scientist, I'm also a rapper. And that's something that I like kept private for a really long time. I essentially, as my colleagues would say, I've kind of Batman Bruce Wayne it for a while. Like I've had my music career for a long time and then I've had my science career and I always kept them really separate. But now being a justice advocate, I've been able to start weaving those two areas of expertise together, which has been really stress relieving for me and fulfilling. Um, I found that, well, when it comes to addressing social justice issues in general, especially when you're working with young people, it can become very overwhelming. You know, if you're just constantly looking at data on, you know, Black and Indigenous maternal mortality rates and, you know, police brutality and such. And so I kind of have um, tried to take taken the advice of Yoko Ono to try to imagine the world that you want to live in and a world that you will be, you know, proud to have helped create. And so I have been actively trying to learn how to weave in the power of imagination in creating, you know, frameworks for just cities and addressing structural racism. And so in that way, um, weaving in the arts, whether it's through music, a comedy, or the visual arts. Um, a murals program is something that I've been like dreaming about and um, trying to actively apply for funds for. I run, I co-run 
a beauty justice coalition. It's a national coalition of scientists and advocates around the country that address toxic chemicals in beauty products that are marketed to women of color. And so we have a lot of advocacy here in the United States and also internationally around addressing skin lighteners that contain mercury, addressing hair straighteners that contain formaldehyde and the white supremacy that's wrapped up in this industry. And so, you know, one of the things that we've been talking about is like, how do we actually, um, bring this to light in a really big way, this issue of um, white supremacy influencing um, the exposures that women of color are facing. And so, you know, we've been discussing having mural projects um, around the United States um, to, to raise awareness to this issue. So there are multiple ways that it, art has come into my life. Great, thank you. I think we're gonna now move to audience questions. Hannah, do you have some? turning on this mic. Great. Thank you all so much. I think the first question we have from a Zoom attendee uh, named Blessing is really fitting for what you've been exploring. And I think we could expand on it a bit. Blessing asks, do you have any advice for creatives that have struggled to integrate their creative practice with professional efforts, especially in community engagement and advocacy? Well, I, what I've done is just tried not to force it and see where it comes naturally. I cannot tell you how many times people have made suggestions to me like, why don't you write a rap about climate change? Or like, you know, just like the most ridiculous things of, in my mind, because I'm like, I'm not that kind of rapper. Um, but I feel like it will come, it will come naturally. Um, but also what I found is that putting yourself out there as an artist and putting like, it's only very recently within the last six months that even on my bio, I actually put artists on my professional bio now, not just on my, of course, it's on my music website, but I never used to include that in my like science bio. Now I do. And now people send me things all the time of like, oh, look at there's this grant that has arts in it, or oh, there's this leadership program you might want to apply to that you know, has artists. And so I found that just um, kind of putting yourself out there, but not forcing it and not letting other people kind of force your art in a particular direction. I, I think blessing one of the things that um, I thought of is to sort of look for, you know, departments like arts and medicine and other kind of apertures where you can come in and show people what you're doing and reach out. I have a lot of artists that reach out um, as well. But I, I think also we need to sort of start changing the nomenclature around artists being sort of this starving artist and that this whole sort of idea of what an artist's role is. Um, and in healthcare, of course, um, licensed creative art therapists are um, increasingly becoming more and more prominent in health systems and um, integral. But, you know, I think that you can absolutely um, look into healthcare and there's a lot of ways that now they're they're certainly thinking about artists contributions artists in residency programs all sorts of different things oh. well, yeah, yeah i think um you know I, I i can't speak from personal experience but as a witness of uh, a whole movement uh in latin america which is the maria verde which is the green wave abortion movement that was born um, in Argentina and really has expanded uh, beyond, you know, this, uh, the Western hemisphere. Uh, and it's just been incredible to see how advocates and activists have within their own expertise from their own vantage points um, pushed, you know, for reproductive health care rights through the arts, through activism, through music and very creative ways. And there are some very established groups now, um, at least in the Latin America region, um, uh, that you know serve as uh, beacons of yeah. examples and and hope on yeah. how to you know create this. Um, I think it was Michaela Terry that was saying this larger symphony, right? We all come to this great symphony playing our own instruments, and it's playing them together, you know, that uh, leads to uh, good results. I think just to add to that, I mean, I was really torn. I was going to go to law school or I was going to go to playwriting school. Um, and I decided to go to law school because of my commitment to justice issues. But I also decided that part of the way I would be a lawyer was to really, um, as best as I could in the courtroom, 
make my clients come alive, right? Um, that I could use my creativity in my work um, to actually make people who were often unseen as seen. And, you know, um, I guess I would always say, so when I was an HIV lawyer, I went to act up and, and watch what they were doing. I mean, there's lots of opportunity throughout whatever path you choose, I think, to use the arts. And even though I've had this career, I've also written plays. So, um, and also, you know, we're in a time where science and evidence is largely irrelevant. Look what's happening at the Supreme Court today. They're looking at, right, abortion medication. Um, so hearts and minds and how you shift people is really important. And I certainly have seen over and over that sometimes it's creativity, it's really not the blah, 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 um, throwing data at people. It's often touching people that, that makes the change. And I think the arts are so critical in that. So um, I think you can always find a way to incorporate the arts no matter what you do. Anna. Thank you. Thank you all. I appreciate this uh, audience member's next question who's in the room. Uh, when I first introduced you all, I spoke of you as having acted from a place of passion. And this participant asks, I'm passionate about helping others, but don't know the exact form that passion will manifest yet. Any advice on how to find that? That's a good question. Great question. Um, I would say, um, you know, seize any opportunities that you can uh, find. You know, when I just think back at my own trajectory, um, even though I wanted to do human rights, you know, specifically during law school, I, you know, uh, lived a summer in Colorado uh, working alongside migrant workers. Um, I, um, you know, was in Boston um, as well. Uh, learning more about HIV AIDS uh, law, you know, uh, writing trust in estates. So dabbling in different things. I, I just um, I had a desire to just absorb information, you know, learn as much as I could. Also to be able to find what I really, really loved and was passionate about my niche. And that happened when I was doing international criminal law and I found reproductive health rights law, um, and, you know, the mere thought that this was an evolving, you know, uh, field of law at the time, uh, the possibility of contributing to that was really um, something that really excited me about that. I, I think that's great advice, Lillian. And when I think about that question, it's a wonderful question, because when you think of the balcony in, in this really broad scape of like human rights, and then it, she has obviously distilled it down into this great passion for reproductive rights and other area, other focus on women's health. Um, so if you are passionate about helping others, which again, I'm assuming everyone in this room is, um, you know, then volunteer, um, get involved in just anything. I mean, come, come volunteer or, or help us at health and hospitals. Um, and then you'll be exposed to a whole world of different kinds of things. And so health and hospitals, for example, you could come in and do some volunteer work and think, oh my gosh, I really want to work with people that are experiencing homelessness in the safety net clinic, or oh, I really want to work with, um, you know, artists working on gun violence or whatever. But you're not going to know that it's not going to like, you're not going to wake up and be like, okay, I want to do exactly this. It's going to be this like path that's going to keep going this way and that. So say yes to opportunity, um, get involved in things, De definitely nurture and develop a network of people to, you have three right now up here um, to reach out to and to help with connections and to open doors and to just pick their, our brains and, and others as well. Um, I think that those are all really helpful to ultimately finding and landing where you, your real dream is. And I'll just add to that, um, like really evaluating your value system. There are lots of, um, Kind of tools for doing this online, but really just thinking about what are your main values and then how do those align or maybe not align with particular career paths. I think we're going to have an exercise on this in one of the panels later today. Um, but let's say if your um, values or top values are like community, um, friendship, fairness, then you know there are particular jobs that might lend itself to those values. Maybe if your value is 
financial top values like financial stability or some other um, sense of like um, security, then maybe some jobs might not fit with that. I always give an example of like, if financial security is one of your top values, then actually working for a community-based organization might not be the best thing because you might not have that kind of financial security. Um, if um, fairness is one of your top values, then working in the justice space might be, you know, great for you. If, um, uh, let's see, be having, uh, being esteemed or seen as a, an esteemed person um, is a top value for you, then like maybe academia might be better than like being in an organization where there's not going to be as much individual like recognition of an individual's contribution, but you work as a team. So just knowing that everybody has different value systems, there's no particular value system is, you know, better than another, but, you know, we should kind of, you're going to feel most fulfilled with when what you're doing is aligned with your particular value. So it's like no judgment in any way. Um, so yeah, that's always useful. Great. Thank you, Hannah. Great. Thank you. This person is looking to expand a little bit or to hear you expand a little bit on how you've assessed risk in your careers. They ask, in pursuing these non-traditional paths, what kept you going in your desire to actualize a career at the intersection of safeguarding public health and your other work? Um, I have to think that's such a great question. Um, I think you touched upon this, but you know, being sort of the Trojan horse, or I, I read an essay, I think in grad school that was called The Tempered Radical. Um, and sort of figuring out how to create change without having to be the overt leader um, and having to, ha how to, um, you know, get things done without necessarily being seen doing it. And it's sort of like doing things really incrementally that you know will take, will create change over time and being patient because you know, and you're steadfast, sort of your, your Emory example, knowing that that was just not your, your path and that you needed to depart from that. Um, I think that those those kinds of theories of change or, or, or um, methods are um, often quite effective. They just take a little bit longer. And sometimes, particularly, I think for women, you know, for us to create change, you have to, you do have to kind of do it in a Trojan horse kind of way. Um, so I, I, I'll say that I think um, this kind of came up in a panel last night. Uh, Tarana Burke was who founded the Me Too movement was talking about risk really. And she talked about, um, you need to have people that you completely trust. And when you're in a moment of high risk in whatever context in your career, you need to talk to them. You need to not just act on impulse because everything is about strategy. Um, you know, so uh, in sometimes in these moments when you're thinking I have to get out of this job or I cannot sit in a room one more day with this person, you know, that's the time when you need to actually uh, talk to people. Um, I One of the things we talk about a lot is why is it really amazing leaders who are intersectional thinkers who are most often people of color end up getting thrown out of positions of power. Um, I think we need to go beyond how we talk about leadership and start really looking at what happens to people who have an intersectional lens um, when they get in positions of power and frankly, they're outplayed um, by people around them. It happens again and again and again. And I think we really need to think about that and start teaching it and get people in here who have had these experiences to give advice. And one of the things they say consistently is have people you trust and talk to them. Um, don't be afraid to take risks, right? But do it strategically and make it count. Um, that's not so easy when you're young in your career, et cetera. But I do think it's ultimately very good advice. Terry, um, I think yes. that's incredibly excellent advice. And actually, when you think of the word risk, I think of like jumping off a bridge or something, you know, you're really taking a risk. But such a good point that, you know, don't be impulsive. Don't be you're like, oh, I, I, I feel so passionately about this that I can't do this. Speak to people that you trust and certainly take the risk and go for it. But absolutely with strategy, because I've done it both ways and strategically definitely has better outcomes. 
Okay. I think we have time for just one more. There's a hand or uh, there's a very engaged audience member with his hand up. Okay. Okay. Go ahead, sir. Has to be careful uh, who they talk to because uh, in leadership, you find that people who are trusted sometimes betray. You know, you tell them something very confidential, not that you want to be a radical, but you know, you might have a difficulty uh, with the situation and uh, they will just mouth it, you know, without thinking about the consequences. So, I think that's you know, perhaps, yeah. leadership has to be very much aware of how to, you know, um, protect people's privacy. I think that's absolutely true. And I think Tarana was pointedly saying that it should be people outside of the institution, right? People that have maybe had similar experiences in different plate, in different jobs so that you're not putting yourself at risk in the institution. But Hannah. Yeah, I'd say for our last question, we have a couple minutes left. Not surprisingly at all, we've had many students ask how they can volunteer with your organizations or work with you or work with your colleagues. So I think it would be a wonderful way to conclude to give you that space. Also, any last thoughts, please? I am very happy to announce that Terry and I just um, received a big $2 million grant to study structural racism. And as part of that grant, we we budget lined in there to hire 10 CUNY SPH students to join our research team. So we will be hiring as soon as that money hits our bank account. So yes, um, just keep that in mind. Um, we do not have $2 million in 10 positions at New York City Public <laughs> Hospital. Um, but we do, in arts and medicine, we do have a pretty robust internship program and we're updating our website and we're on the Bloomberg Connects app, which is a free um, art and culture app. We're the only healthcare facility on it because of our art collection. Um, others I've heard are coming, but um, so we have that. And we're also in the middle of developing a fellowship for public health students that will allow them to be embedded in the arts and medicine department and um, work on some of the projects that we mentioned uh, earlier. One of the, for, for example, um, we have artists and residents that are embedded in our system for a year specifically to raise awareness for a certain strategic priority. So um, last year it was gun violence and hospital violence prevention programs. And this year we're looking to kind of illuminate the work of um, women's health and community health workers. And so um, so more on that to come. It's not like totally updated yet, but in the next couple of months, please look back to that or reach out to me. And we uh, strive to work all over the world. And so we have partners in Latin America, uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, uh, Korea is our latest partner in Europe, uh, very strong partnerships with doctor-led organizations that are helping turn the tide in particular countries to make abortion laws more progressive. So if you are interested in any of those areas in the world and reproductive health rights law, uh, give us a call, email us. Uh, we, I am thrilled to say that we now have a more formal relationship with CUNY and so uh, we are interviewing um, CUNY students uh, to come intern uh, and volunteer for, for GDC. Um, so, um, and one more thing that I wanted to add is just the value of informational uh, interviews. Even, you know, if it's not one of us on the panel, and if there's someone who you really would love to talk to from whatever organization it is, shoot them an email. You know, say, I would love to chat with you, even if it's 10, 15 minutes. And I bet you you're going to get uh, yeses. People are happy to um, to help and give back. Yeah. Scratch them off the list. <laughs> OK, so we're at the end of our time. I want to actually thank Hannah and all of her team and all of the employees and students at CUNY School of Public Health who made this so lovely this morning. Um, I really, really want to thank our panelists, both for taking the time to actually share your really interesting journeys, but also for having the courage to kind of think out of the box your entire careers and keep moving when you found your situation intolerable. Um, so a round of applause for our panelists. And uh, 
I'd like to hand it over to Maya to talk about what happens next. Okay, oh. great. Okay. Thank you all so much. Let's have one more round of applause, okay. please, for our panel. So we have a 10 minute transition now. Uh, my colleague, Maya Lloyd, is going to walk you all through that. And I just wanted to say for the students, uh, in reference to much of what was just discussed, that you should please reach out to us at Career Services if you're interested. We very are we are very fortunate to have partnerships and relationships with these uh, amazing organizations. So we'd be happy to work with you if you are not quite sure how to get started. With all that said, I will pass over to Maya uh, for the next phase of the morning. Thank you all. Okay, so the screen will probably pop up here once I start talking, but uh, you can see it on the TV screens behind you. Um, so good morning, everyone. My name is Maya Lloyd. I am the program manager for the Office of Experiential Learning and Career Services at CUNY School of Public Health. So I'm here to transition us to our next portion of the event. Okay, and this is for in-person and for virtually. So thank you so much for coming out with us today. So after such a wonderful event, we're going to head now to our breakout sessions. So you have your choice of attending. Oh, here we go. You have your choice of attending one of the panels for the hour. So the law breakout panel is on this floor. The arts or public health advocacy breakout panels, those are both on the eighth floor upstairs. So you can either take the elevator or the stairs to the rooms. The breakout rooms will also be opened on Zoom shortly for those that are joining us virtually. Please note that each classroom has a capacity, but we do have additional classrooms if you still want to attend that specific room, or you can just choose another classroom to join. And with that, I hope you enjoy our breakout sessions and we'll see you back here for lunch. Please take your things with you because we have to set up the auditorium for lunch. Thank you. 